We are nearing the end of the book of Deuteronomy, and there, there's really so much, so much packed into this book. It really is one of the wonderful books of Scripture. I mean, look, we're not supposed to say, I like this book more than that book, or this book is better than that book, or anything like that. I think in real life, in real life, you all like certain books of Scripture. There are certain books of Scripture that stand out to you. And to me, uh, the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy, really stand out to me. Uh, maybe it's just because of what I do. Maybe it's because as pastor, they, they really kind of they really kind of say a lot to me in my life. Deuteronomy is one of those books for me. Uh, the Gospel of John. I'm, so I'm, I'm I'm kind of going through this period where I'm where I'm writing through and studying through and preaching through some of my favorite books in Scripture. Deuteronomy is one of my favorite books in Scripture. And too many people, man, man, too many people miss miss out on what's in Deuteronomy, what an awesome book it is. In Deuteronomy, we see a review of Israel's history. Uh, we see a review of the law of Moses. In this book, Moses is preaching a series of sermons. Sermons! Uh, again, that's probably why I like, maybe one of the reasons why I like it. You know, he's preaching a series of sermons to the people of Israel as they're about to enter into the promised land. And they are hearing what you're hearing right now. They're hearing preaching. The people of Israel are hearing preaching in this book. Significant messages that they need. And that they need right now, as they're about to enter into the promised land, and that they're going to need as they go in and inherit the land. And that their kids are going to need, and their kids are going to need, and that ultimately we're going to need. We need these sermons what I mean when I say we need what Moses preaches here. We need the book of Deuteronomy. We need every book of Scripture. We need the book of Deuteronomy. In this book, Moses calls Israel to be faithful to the Lord. And I think, I think the church today, I think the church today needs to listen to that call. I think the church today has not been faithful in the last year. I think the last 10 months has tested a lot of people. And a lot of people have failed. I think the church overall has failed. Last week, Moses preached a lengthy message about the blessings of faithfulness and the curses of faithlessness. Today, the covenant with Israel is renewed. God's covenant with his people is renewed. Remember, this entire book, Deuteronomy, is written in the form of a covenant, like a treaty almost. Right? It's, it's, it's a lot like an ancient treaty where there are stipulations. You have the king who is the one who's in, he's, he's the one who brings peace and who who blesses his people, and you have the subjects who, who are, and protects his people, and you have the subjects who need to be faithful to that king. And God is renewing that agreement between himself and the second generation of Israel right now, before they go and inherit the land. Today, that covenant language in Deuteronomy 29 continues. And, and really, we're, we deal with a verse that's often maybe used out of context at some point, but uh, we'll get to see a little bit of that context today. Let's start in uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 29, verse 1. These are the words of the covenant, which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the sons of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he had made with them at Oreb. And so uh, you have even here just a reminder of the the one who's giving the covenant, the ones who are receiving the covenant, where they are, they're in the land of Moab. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that it's really being given to the next generation because the, the, when the covenant was first given, it was given at Oreb, at Sinai. Right? And so this covenant, uh, this relationship takes place as a result of God's work. Uh, God has done his part. Uh, he's renewing this covenant with Israel. He has done his part. He will continue to do his part. And they need to remember what he has done. Those are words the church can hear. Well, let's, let's, let's first look and see what he's done in verses 2, two through 4. Uh, and Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen, you, your eyes, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land. These Hebrews shouldn't need a reminder, but they do. The great trials which your eyes have seen, those great signs 
and wonders. Israel exists as a nation because of what happened in Egypt. And the people there who are on the other side of the Jordan River, who are about to go in the conquest generation, the generation is going to go and conquer the land. They've seen this stuff. They saw it when they were little. They saw what God, remember, I was 40 years earlier. They saw what God had done. They exist as a nation because of what the Lord did to Egypt and to Pharaoh. They exist as a nation because of the great and mighty plagues, the great trials which your eyes have seen, those great signs and wonders. Yet, yet, and that's a, that word right there says a lot, doesn't it? Look at everything that God did. Yet, yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. In spite of God's mighty acts on their behalf, Israel has continued in rebellion. They've, and, and, and the dynamic is like this. They, as they continue to reject what God says, God can't continue to draw them in. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Right? God wants them to come to repentance. And yet, yet, there's an element within Israel, and maybe perhaps the, 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 the greater characterization of the people of Israel is that uh, they don't have a heart to know or eyes to see or ears to hear. And yet God has remained faithful. God has remained faithful to the covenant in spite of their rebellion, in spite of the rebellion that took place on Mount Sinai or at Mount Sinai, in spite of the rebellion that took place at the waters of Meribah, in spite of the rebellion that took place uh, at Baal Peor with the uh, idolatry that took place with Baal. And yet God has continued to remain faithful to them. Uh, this, this reminds me of the church this year. Look at everything that God has done for us. And look at all the things that we're distracted with. Look at how we blew it. Look at how we blew. 2020 was, we could have looked back at 2020. We can look back and say, like 2020, say 2020, it could have been a gift to the church. It could have been the circumstances that the church needed to go into the world and make a difference for the gospel. Instead, we whined and we complained and we rebelled. We are, the, we are this generation. The church is this, the, the, the 21st century church is just like these Israel, these Israelites. Can you see that? Can you, can you kind of like understand where, where, how I'm thinking about that a little bit? If you can't see that, then you might be part of the problem. Man, we are so distracted. Man, we blew it. We blew 2020. We blew it. Israel needs to remember what the Lord had done in Egypt. They need to remember that God had provided for them in the desert. Look at verses 5 and 6. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals, your sandal has not worn on, out on your foot. You have not eaten bread, nor, uh, sorry, you have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or strong drink, in order that you might know that I am the Lord your God. In these forty years, God has miraculously provided for His people. Uh, their clothes and their sandals haven't worn out in forty years. Think about that. Now, uh, anyone here, uh, you wear dress shoes regularly. Anyone here wear dress shoes regularly? Don, maybe. Any guys, you wear dress shoes regularly? Like, let's say once a week, you wear dress shoes to church. I see that back there, <laughs> little man. <laughs> um, I wear dress shoes uh, every week to church for the most part. And these shoes, uh, I, I, I basically have two pairs. Is it two pairs or two pair? I don't know, it doesn't matter. So let's just say two pairs. And, and, and they, they don't last that long. If you, if, if we were having, you know, we're having Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, I say I could get maybe, I might be able to squeeze two years out before they start falling apart. I, I, I think two pairs of shoes ago, I didn't even realize it, but right in the front here, there was a hole that was almost going all the way through. Oh, I just touched the bottom of my shoe. Ah. Oh. You know, a year ago, that wouldn't have bothered me so much. Right now, it's, it bothers me a little bit more. I need to get some some uh, some sanitizer on me real quick. Uh, anyway, uh, there was there was like a hole going through. And it's like two years. 
It's like two years. I could probably squeeze out two years on a pair of shoes. I have sneakers and I, and I rotate those sneakers and they don't, they, maybe I, I get a few years out of them. I don't tend to get 10 years. If you get 10 years out of your shoes and either you're not wearing them enough, right? Well, you're not wearing them. You have a lot of shoes, right? <laughs> or, or you have less shoes or both, right? Something like that. You, you know, you're unlikely to get, uh, Roxanne will have shoes that are 10 years. She's, I'm like, oh, you never wear these shoes. And they're like falling apart in, in, the, in the closet, right? So, so try to imagine 40 years, ancient sandals, 40 years without wearing out. Right. Um, that's pretty much that's impossible. And traveling through the desert places, that's that's not really possible. This is this is God's miraculous provision of them, not to mention the fact that life in the desert is not sustainable. I mean, it might be sustainable for a few people like there are people that are desert nomads. They may travel around. They may go from oasis to oasis. Right. Like they'll find a little place where there's water and trees and then they'll travel to the next place where there's water and trees and stuff like that. And they'll live in the desert peoples. But you can't uh, over a million people can't survive in the desert for 40 years. There aren't enough um, there aren't enough resources. It's not possible. And so that in and of itself shows God's sustaining of them. It's evidence that God has kept them alive. It's evidence that he is the one true God. They need to remember what he's done in Egypt. They need to remember what he's done in these last 40 years in the wilderness. They need to remember that he has protected them from their enemies in verses 7 and 8. When you reached this place, Sion, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out to meet us for battle. We read, we read those accounts. We studied those accounts. But we defeated them, and we took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manassites. Uh, this covenant is between king and subject, and the king has miraculously delivered them from slavery. He's miraculously provided for them for 40 years in the desert. And he has defeated their enemies in battle. Look at what God has done. He has done his part. So when we think of this passage as a covenant, like covenant renewal, it's important that you see that it really starts with look at what God's done. We are entering into agreement, the people of Israel and the Lord, Look at what God has done for you. And now that God, it, it reminds me a little bit of, um, it reminds me a little bit of the fall of, of Babylon. So uh, that when Babylon fell, it was uh, quote unquote liberated, right? So, uh, so the Persians came in, uh, the, the Medo-Persian, uh, the, um, yeah, the, the Medo-Persians come in and they, and they kind of, um, uh, right? Persians, yeah. And they deliver Babylon, and they call themselves uh, what do you call it when you liberators, liberators, right? And the people of Babylon rejoiced, and they seem to be happy to follow the next king, right? God has done all this for them, and the people of Israel should rejoice. They should be. They should be willing to serve this king. And on the basis of his actions, that is why this covenant is even, even an option. That's why they're alive to enter into this covenant. So keep the words of this covenant to do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. God has fulfilled his part. Their part was to keep the words of the covenant. You stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God, your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, and your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the alien who is within your camps, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which the Lord your God is making with you today, in order that he may establish you today as his people and that he may be your God, just as he spoke to you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Look at, uh, their part was to keep the words of the covenant. Their part uh, was to be faithful to the Lord, and the result would be that they would prosper. And everyone, everyone was to do it. Everyone, all of them. Their chiefs, elders, officers, tribes, uh, all the men, even... 
the little ones, the wives, and the stranger, the alien, the foreigner, the proselyte, the foreigner who has decided to place himself under the agreement with God. Now, uh, you'll notice here at, in verse 13 that God spoke this covenant to their fathers, to Abraham, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The fathers had entered into covenant with the Lord. Right, and maybe it wasn't as expanded as the Mosaic covenant, right? Like it wasn't as expanded as what the, they didn't know as much as maybe Moses knew, right? But they had entered into agreement with the Lord. They had, uh, they had agreed to remain faithful to the Lord as their God. But just because their fathers had entered into covenant with the Lord didn't mean that they were automatically okay. You understand? They themselves had to enter into that covenant. They themselves had to submit to the Lord as their God. They themselves had to be faithful to his word. And it kind of reminds me of the church today as well. So this is the dynamic that we see today. Mom and dad, or grandpa and grandma, or whatever, right? Mom and dad place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the kids rest on the laurels of their parents. I'm a Christian. My parents are Christians. And so, uh, so I'm good to go. I've even seen pride among second generation, quote unquote, second generation Christians where their parents were Christians and where they knew all types of stuff. They knew the Bible, but they didn't live the Bible. And they thought it was sufficient. Just like in this covenant, just like in this passage, this second generation, they can't rest on the laurels of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or even the, uh, the, the conquest generation, uh, the Exodus generation who, who entered into covenant with the Lord at Mount Sinai. They themselves need to appropriate faith. They themselves need to trust in the Lord their God. They themselves need to submit to him. And that's what has to happen even today. God has no grandchildren. Right? The old, the old statement, God has no grandchildren. Just because your parents are Christians, just because your parents are faithful, doesn't mean that you are. It doesn't give you any special status with God. You must also place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you, there are second generation Christians that can be a shame to the parent, right? And there are second generation Christians that can outdo the parent, that their faithfulness is so strong that it actually makes the parent's faithfulness look less. We've seen both of those things, haven't we? We've seen, we've seen kids of believers, and look, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You can, you can train your kids up, and look, at the end of the day, they've got to decide whether they're going to follow the Lord. I can, I can teach my kids Bible studies. I can, I can uh, have prayer times with them, right? I can I can tell them, like, they have to read the Bible every day and all this stuff. And, and one of them said uh, earlier this week, one of them said, I said, oh, you're not going to be able to play your games today. Because one of my rules is, you know, you can't play video games unless you read your Bible. Right? And uh, you can't watch TV until the house is clean, you read your Bible. And uh, I said, uh, well, you know, we're going to move your game day to tomorrow. And, and I'm not going to say which one it was, but one of the smaller ones said, um, but I read my Bible today already. I, I read it so that I can play. And I said, what? Yeah, I read it so that I could play. That's not fair. You can't take it away from me. And I, I was like, you don't read the Bible so that you can play video games? Now, I know, do I know that that happens? Of course I know that happens. Of course I know. Like, I can't make people do the right thing for the right reason. Right? So at the end of the day, they're going to have to choose to come to faith or they're going to have to choose what type of faithfulness they're going to have, regardless of what I teach them or even show them, right? So is there a chance I can do everything the way I'm supposed to do it? My kids still turn away. Yeah, of course there's a chance. My faith doesn't guarantee their faith. The general principle is that if you train a child up in the way they should go, they won't depart from it, right? But they still have to decide whether they want to place their faith in Jesus Christ. Right? And that's what I'm calling the young people in this room. 
the second generation Christians in this room. I'm talking to my kids. I'm talking to the Macaron kids. I'm talking to the Capabianco kids and Nivel kids. I might actually be talking to some of the adults too. The Zanella kids. Right? I might be talking to some of the adults too. Maybe your parents were Christians and maybe you know, you're just kind of, uh, you know, I don't know. You're a Christian by association, by name. I'm calling all of you that you need to come to faith in Jesus Christ. You can't rest on the laurels of your parents or of the generations that preceded you. This is not just a covenant that extends to the second generation of Israel. It extends to all generations of Israel. Look at verses 14 through. I'll try to pick up the pace a little bit. Now, not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath, but both with those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. For you know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. Moreover, you have seen their abominations and their idols of wood, stone, silver, and gold, which they had with them, so that there will not be among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations, that there will not be among you a root bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. This generation, they've seen the idols of the nations. They saw the, all the idols of, of Egypt. And as they traveled through the desert, maybe they were protected from a ta- for a time. But as they started inheriting the land over on the other side of the Jordan River, the Transjordan area, the land of uh, Sion, uh, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, as they start to inherit that, those lands, what do you think they see in town after town? But the idols of the people of the land. They've seen the idolatry of Egypt. They've seen the idolatry of the people of that land. They've defeated those nations in battle, saw those idols, and even participated in some of that idolatry. And we've already read about that at Bel Peor. Moses is calling for complete Faithfulness. He's speaking against the heart that turns away from the Lord their God. And in that case, we see idolatry being the root and poisonous fruit and wormwood being the consequence. If you turn aside from the Lord, there will be consequences. Instead of blessing, instead of manna and water and and inheriting a land flowing with milk and honey, which is a, that's a, what do you call that? A figure of speech, euphemism? What did you you say? Metaphor, euphemism, whatever, right? Um, Like a, it's not literally like pouring milk out of the, you know, I, I say that all the time. It's like, like the picture I have is like you, you, you as you, as you're getting up to like Mount, you're getting up to like Mount Nebo and you climb up to the top of Pisgah's Heights and you look over and you just see like a flood of milk and honey flowing over the Jordan River. Like it's not that, right? It's just, it's, this is a bountiful land. It's good for pasturing. Instead of a land of flowing with milk and honey, they would have poisonous fruit and poisonous water. And so Israel is entering into covenant with the Lord on the basis of what he has done. It's a covenant that they must be faithful to. It's a covenant, unfortunately, that will be broken with great consequences. It shall be when he hears the words of this curse that he will boast, saying, I have peace, even though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart in order to destroy the watered land with the dry. Oh, you know, I understand there's all those curses out there, but I have peace. I'm blessed, even though I'm an idolater. I don't follow the Lord and look at me. I'm Bill Gates. I'm the Antichrist. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just teasing about that. <laughs> I don't believe Bill Gates is the Antichrist anyway at all. He's not, um, he is not an authority figure of Rome so he can't possibly be the Antichrist. <laughs> Just a little Bible there for you. Um, Bill Gates, oh, look, look how God has blessed me. Or the owner of Bitcoin, right? Or whatever, right? I don't follow God. 
And look at me or Steve Jobs. That's the general mindset that we're seeing here. The idolater will commit his idolatry with pride and he will do it without fear of the Lord or his God. He'll boast against God. He'll claim all the blessings, the peace of this covenant, even though he's turned away from it. And as a result, he will bring the curses of the law. He'll, you know what he'll bring? He'll bring a destruction to the watered land. Uh, check this out. I want to show you. Um, maybe, uh, you know what? Let me just wait on that. because Let's just read a little bit longer before I show you this. God will consume their land with fiery judgment. Verse 20, the Lord shall never be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord, well, because the guy rejects that forgiveness, right? Uh, but the anger, rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man. And every curse which is written in this book will rest on him and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Then the Lord will single out for adversity. Uh, well, then the Lord will single him out for adversity from all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant, which are written in this book of the law. So there will be burning wrath and destruction from God. There will be utter desolation in verses 22 through 23. Now the generation to come, your sons who rise up after you, and the foreigner who comes from a distant land, when they see the plagues of the land and the diseases with which the Lord has afflicted it, will say that the generations to come and, and the foreigners will say this. When they see the destruction of, of the land, they'll say, all its land is brimstone, or like sulfur, fiery salt, brimstone and salt. All this land, the land that was flowing with milk and honey, is brimstone and salt. A burning waste, unsown and unproductive. Nothing can grow there and no grass grows in it like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Uh, this is the shores of the Dead Sea. It's called the Dead Sea for a reason, right? <laughs> you know, not much can survive in it. Maybe like, I don't know, some types of amoeba or something. I, I, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm no expert on what can survive. If there's anything that can survive in the Dead Sea. Not much. This uh, is not sand. This is salt. And so on the shores of the Dead Sea is salt and destruction. And if you look around the Dead Sea, it's just all desolation. It's just like you're just in the desert. Uh, it, uh, the, the, the day before we went down there, the guy says, um, the, the, um, Mickey, his name was Mikhail. He was our, our tour guide. And he said, actually, was, I think a couple days, don't shave 48 hours within 48 hours ago in there or something like that. And, uh, and I found out why the next day, cause I had some, some, some chafing from walking around so much. And I went into the uh, Dead Sea and oh, oh, you ever hear the term rubbing salt into wounds, right? Uh, I never really understood that term so much until I went into the Dead Sea. And then I was like, ah, I was like, it was like Kevin on Home Alone, right? You know, so it was, it was, it, you know, it was painful. Well, anyway, he said, uh, he said, it's hot down there. And uh, when we get down there, wake up early. If you're going to swim, get down there at like five or six in the morning because you are not going to want to be there like 11 o'clock. You're not going to want to be in that water. All right. And I'm thinking, what? That's like, I'm not, I don't want to get down there. At five. Okay. Okay. I'll believe what he says. I'm going to do it. You know, and I get up at five or six in the morning and it's, you know, it's, it's not bad. It's kind of, it was kind of nice, the temperature. And I get into the water and I'm like, the water was disgusting. But I floated, you know, if I had a newspaper and I'd taken a picture with me floating and, you know, uh, at 11 o'clock, I mean, the water was warm at, at six in the morning, seven in the morning, the water was warm. At 11 o'clock, it would have been steamy, hot down there in that desert and the water would have been even more disgusting. All right, so then I understood what he was saying. And you look around at this hot desert waste of an area. Really? 
And that land of salt is what the entire land would become. It's a, the metaphor, really. The whole land would become a land of destruction. And the ensuing generations would see these plagues and diseases in verse 20, verse 22. The plagues of the land, the diseases of the land uh, that the land is afflicted with. And say, look at this wasteland. And the nations would see this and it would cause confusion. All the nations will say, why has the Lord done thus to this land? Why this great outburst of anger? The nations are going to look at this and they're going to be confused. Why has God destroyed this land? He delivered these people from Egypt. He brought them through the wilderness for 40 years. He delivered them against their enemies. And now this place is destroyed. Why? Then men will say, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers. They were not faithful to the covenant that God had made with them. Which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served other gods. I mean, think, how could you serve another? How could you serve these other gods? All these gods you defeated. How could you serve Chemosh or, or Milcom or Molech or Baal or Asherah or Ashtaroth? How could you serve those gods after everything that God had done for you? Gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against that land to bring upon it every curse which is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and in fury, and in great wrath. You know, these are words that nobody wants to describe God with today. Oh, God, my God's a God of love. My God would never condemn anybody. My God isn't angry. No, God has just, righteous, holy anger against sin. Uh, the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger, and in fury, and in great wrath, and cast them into another land as it is this day. Now, the pagans had twisted view, views about, about God or about the gods. They would have seen the Lord as the local God, a God whose power was only over that land. And they would have said, why is this local God, why did this local God kick them out and let his land be desolated? It doesn't make sense. Most of the time, the gods protect their people. Most of the time, there's a manipulation effect between the people and the God. And if they feed the God, the God will protect them, right? Um, so they would have a complete misunderstanding about it. Uh, they would even understand why God's judgment would come. And we see that kind of later on in the prophets. Uh, let me just read a, a couple of verses here for you. Uh, 1 Kings 9. Listen to this. Uh, and this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone who passes by will be astonished and hiss and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And they will say, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and they adopted other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this adversity on them. The nations would question it, but the answer was clear. In Jeremiah 22, 8, we have the same thing. Uh, many nations will pass by this city. The foreign nations, the pagans, will pass by this city, and they will say to one another, why has the Lord done thus to this great city? And then they will answer, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord their God, and because they bowed down to other gods and served them. In the end, Israel would be, uh, Israel would be exiled. Um, the northern kingdom would be defeated by the Assyrians right around 722 BC, and they would be taken away into captivity and uh, their capital city would be destroyed. Samaria would be destroyed. In 586 and thereabouts, 587, 586 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah and its capital city, Jerusalem, would be destroyed by fire. And the people of Israel would be taken to Babylon as a result of their rebellion. The people of Israel, the exodus, the, the, the conquest generation, the second generation, 
while Moses is still alive, they're hearing all of this. This chapter, you know what this chapter is? It's a summary of the whole book. It's a summary. This chapter is a summary of the whole book of Deuteronomy. It's a summary of the whole law of Moses. It's in one chapter, really, the covenant. Look what God has done for you. Look how he delivered you. Look how he provided for you. Look how he defeated your enemies. And you must be faithful to him. And if you're not, you'll be destroyed and the entire land will be destroyed. People of Israel hear these words in the plains of Moab across from Jericho. They stand in awe of the great destruction that will eventually come upon them. And they would think, how could our nation face this? How could this happen? How could we be destroyed so badly? How could the nations say such things about the coming destruction? And at that thought, Moses says the final words of this paragraph. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. The nations are going to see Israel's future destruction. They don't know the whole story. None of them knew the timing of it. None of them really understood what this covenant meant, the requirements that God had. Yes, there will be a future destruction of Israel, but there will also be a restoration. Uh, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. The timing of this destruction, the reason behind the destruction is known. The timing of the destruction, the restoration wasn't known just yet. That Israel would be restored. They wouldn't know all the facts. The nations wouldn't know all the facts. And so there's a level of, and and by the way, we use this to kind of like, listen, God hasn't hasn't revealed everything there is to know. God's, God's word is not exhaustive. He doesn't give us every piece of information that exists. That's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to give you everything you need for life and godliness. It's not exhaustive. He didn't tell us all about everything that science tells us today. He didn't tell us about atoms breaking down or nuclei or whatever, right? Like we don't know all that stuff. We don't know everything there is going to know, there is to know about the future. But we know everything we need to know for life and godliness. So there are things, there are questions we might have. And sometimes the kids will ask me questions and I'll say, look, at the end of the day, we can never know that answer. Maybe when we get to heaven one day, maybe when we stand before God one day, we'll know that answer. But for now, we don't know that answer. But there are things we do know. There are things that God revealed. And those things belong to us and to our sons forever. We have this book. We have God's word that he has revealed. And it is for us to know him. And it is for us for the purpose of Uh, the people of Israel observing all the words of this law, the things that God had revealed in the book of Deuteronomy were so that they would be faithful to the Lord. And the things that we have today in this word are so that we would be faithful to the Lord. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness, so that the man of God may be mature, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. In this passage, Israel is being called to enter into the covenant, to renew the covenant. And the covenant being an agreement, kids, an agreement between God and man. Look what God has done. Israel must be faithful. If Israel's not faithful, there will be consequences. It's a covenant that their fathers had entered into. It's a covenant that they themselves will enter into. It's a covenant that their children will enter into. It's ultimately a covenant that they'll break with great consequences. The breaking of this covenant would result, though, in God making a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A covenant whereby, check this out, um, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The covenant is made with Israel, by the way, the new covenant. New covenant is not made with the church. It's made with Israel and with Judah. We're beneficiaries of it. Anyway, 
Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, although I spread my wing over them, although I took care of them, although I protected them, although I saved their lives, although I provided for them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me. This hasn't been fulfilled yet. There are some jokers out there who say, oh, this, this is the church. The church is Israel. God, you know, this has been fulfilled in the church. This hasn't been fulfilled yet. We await this fulfillment. We are seeing parts of it fulfilled, maybe. We're beneficiaries of it, but this doesn't get fulfilled until Jesus comes back and rules for a thousand years and for all eternity. And that day, the new covenant is fulfilled. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. There's an aspect of this that we're, we're benefiting from today by faith in Jesus Christ. This new covenant is based on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The first covenant wasn't perfect. The blood of bulls and goats could never fully remove the stain of sin. The blood of Jesus Christ pays for the sin of every man for all time. We can look back at Jesus' death on the cross as the perfect payment for sin. It gives us everlasting life. One day that covenant will be fulfilled. And so I would encourage you to place your faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross. Your faithfulness to the Lord today doesn't look like keeping the Mosaic covenant. It looks like placing your faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross. And if you place your faith in Christ, you have everlasting life. If you turn away from that faith, that's evidence that you're lost. And you'll face everlasting contempt. We like that second generation of Hebrews, need to commit our lives to the Lord as the one true God. And we do that today by placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you would take your hymnals and turn to 246, uh, if you're not sure you're saved, you come and see me or come forward and, and, and we'll get you lined up with someone to explain that the gospel message to you. Maybe, maybe you're one of those guys who blew it. You blew 2020. And you've been distracted by the various things that life has thrown in your way. And today you want to repent. Today you want to refocus on the Lord and on his work. Then while we sing, you take care of that and, uh, and take care of business with God. 246, stand and sing.